Swapping a Corvette's LS7 into another ride can be a very tight fit. The solution, convert their bulky DRET oiling system to the smaller wet sump. Welcome to Engine Power, where the search for more is our number one agenda. The 505 horsepower LS7 is the most powerful natural aspirated LS engine and was only available in Z06 Corvettes. That makes it the most sought after power plant for swaps into wild rides like airplanes, helicopters, sand rails, and anything on four wheels. Today, we're going to show you how to convert this LS7 from its factory DRET system to a wet sump oiling system to make swaps easier by saving room in the engine bay, cash on oil changes, and get it ready to transplant into your project. Plus, we're going to add close to 100 horsepower with some off-the-shelf parts. These engines can be a little pricey, but there's no doubt you're going to have a serious powerhouse on your hands. Now, as far as finding one, don't worry, they're readily available. This thing looks good, money bags. Where'd you pick it up? Uh, this is an internet deal. Z06 Corvette, burnt down, 10,000 miles, pretty much complete. It needs a few things, so I don't need the car anyways. Heck of a find. Yeah. The LS7 Corvette was the only GM vehicle with this unique oiling system. Now, the Z06 Corvette was able to pull more than three Gs, and if a standard wet sump was used, oil would be forced away from the pickup and starve the engine of oil. Here's the factory LS7 oiling system minus the oil cooler. Now it's referred to as a DRET system, D-R-E-T, and it combines both a dry and a wet together. Now this is the oil tank, you have a feed and a supply line, and the oil pan. Now the pump is best described as two pumps in one. You have a scavenge side and a supply side. Here's a look at how the oil flows through the system. From the tank, it's gravity fed to the supply side of the pump. That pumps it back to the oil filter, through the oil cooler, and back into the engine. Now the oil goes through the engine and drains back down into the pan. Now the scavenge side of the pump pulls the oil through the pickup, goes through the pump, and returns it back to the oil tank. Now since most of the vehicles that are swapped with an LS7 will never see the abuse or the G's of a Z06 Corvette, we're gonna swap this one out to a true wet sump. Now what we're gonna use is a Holly oil pan with their new Pro Tour baffle set up with trap doors an LS3 balancer from ATI, an LS3 Mellings high volume oil pump, LS3 windage tray, a comp double roll 4X LS3 timing set, as well as a new timing chain cover. Now this is pretty cool, this is a jig that's gonna help us put a dipstick into the block without getting it off and messing it up. We'll show you how to do that later. We chose this one because the company we got it from pulls them apart, checks everything, and cleans them so they can guarantee it to the customer. We'll start the teardown by removing the front accessories. The belt will be the first thing to go. Next up is the water pump assembly. Now loosen the power steering pump and reservoir to access the main bracket bolts and remove it with the alternator attached. The AC compressor can go now along with its mounting bracket. LS7s have center dump manifolds. So these can be removed since we'll run long tubes on the dyno. And we won't need a starter, so away it goes. We'll use our Matco balancer remover tool to remove the factory piece. The parts removed from this point on will be kept around and put to good use in the future. The LS7 has a couple of drain plugs. The front one is to drain the external oil tank and lines that come into the side of the pan. The rear one is to drain the pan sump. With the pan out of the way, we can remove the windage tray. Back up front, the timing cover needs to come off to access the oil pump and the timing chain. Now here's a better look at the pump showing the scavenge and the supply side. Now we need to remove the valve covers, remove the rockers and the push rods to take the pressure off the lifters before we pull the timing chain. Man, compression sounds good, ring should be fine. Now we can pin the chain tensioner, which allows us to remove the three cam sprocket bolts and the rest of the assembly. Normally, this would be the time we would go ahead and swap the camshaft, but our plans are to do the oil system swap first and get a baseline back on the dyno. Then we'll go ahead and swap the camshaft and springs and see what we get. Right now, it's time for a break. When we come back, the new parts go on.
Our LS7 is ready to get dressed. This time it's going to be a little less flashy since it's losing everything related to the DRET system. Now our first new part to go on is pretty important. If you get this wrong, it will not run. We're going to be running a Comp Cams LSX double row with a 4X sprocket and a 3 bolt cam pattern. Now the cool thing about this is it's a double row with a heat treated chain. It's already been pre-stretched. With the 9 position crank sprocket pressed into place, I'll set it up at zero, which means there will be no retard or advance of the camshaft in relation to the crankshaft. Medium strength Loctite will keep the bolts in place. This trick flow dampener is made of durable OE plastic and provides a small amount of tension on the chain, which keeps it from whipping during gear changes. Now I've got a little tip for you guys that won't cost but about $5, but can save you thousands. If you're gonna stop during any part of your assembly, go away and come back. After you've torqued a bolt, put a little line on it. Now this can do two things. It's an instant visual to let you know what's been torqued, but also when you tear the motor down, if the lines have separated, you know a bolt has moved. Since the oil pump is basically the heart of the engine, we want it to work as efficient as possible. So we're gonna go ahead and knock off any sharp edges where the oil goes in and out of the pump. That's gonna give the oil a nice smooth path to flow. When using a grinder like this, don't apply a lot of pressure or RPM. Let the cartridge roll do the work. You just guide it. Now as you work away the edges, remember to make a smooth radius to promote flow. Now we can wash the housing and it's ready to go on. I'm using silicone to hold these two spacers in place that were supplied with the timing set. They go between the pump housing and the block to give us the clearance for that thicker chain. Now just finger tighten the pump for now. First, lube and install the crank sprocket. Then the driven gear will go into place. And shim it against the pump housing using three one and a half thousand shims. Now install the drive gear and shim it against the crank sprocket with the same size shims. And when the pump is tightened in a crisscross pattern, it's aligned with the crankshaft and will prevent premature pump housing wear. With a little Loctite on the cover bolts, we can close the pump back up. When spacing the milling oil pump away from the block to clear the double row timing set, we moved it closer to the timing cover. Now that caused an interference so the cover won't sit flush against the block, but we've got an easy fix for that. Apply machinist dye around the area the pump comes closest to the cover. Now push the cover towards the pump and wiggle it around against it. Remove the cover and you'll have bare aluminum showing where the interference is. We have a mark here, here, and here. That needs to be clearanced. Because the material is so thin, use a cartridge roll rather than a burr to keep from breaking through. Using the gasket, install the cover and just run it down. The extra thickness of the gasket will ensure we have the necessary clearance. We'll tighten it up in just a bit. The factory dipstick pad is still on the block without a hole in it. The original dipstick was in the external tank. And Tech AFX offers the perfect solution to add one with this dipstick drill guide for the LS7. Now drill through the block using the fixture as your guide. Then you can test fit the GM LS tube which seals to the block with an O-ring. Nice. Once the hole is chamfered. This is where a few more small clearance issues could come into play, but no worries. They're all super simple fixes. Now we're losing the LS7 windage tray for an LS3 version. Now this thing's job is to interrupt the vortex of oil caused by crankshaft rotation and get it down into the sump faster so the pickup doesn't starve for oil. Now this one is a little bit shorter than the LS7s, so that could raise our first concern. When the parts in the engine get up to temperature, they expand. Right now, this is not touching, but it's a little too close for comfort. So we'll place 10 washers underneath the tray, drop it back in place, torque it to spec, and now you can see a lot more clearance between the two, which this is plenty. Next up is the old pump pickup, which was supplied with the pan kit. Then we'll apply some Loctite anti-seize to the crank snout and install an ATI LS3 balancer. Remember we left the timer cover loose to allow the balancer to center it. An ARP balancer bolt will keep it snug and tight to the crankshaft. A Holly Pro Tour baffle with three trap doors will keep oil in the sump. It'll also control oil slosh and is designed to be a bolt-in piece to their retrofit oil pans. 
Now on a previous LS build, we had some oil seeping past the bolts that hold the pan on. So we'll use a small dab of silicone to avoid that problem. And using a straight edge, we'll make sure that the front and rear covers are flush with the block. And it's a good fit. Now we can tighten them down and the bottom end is sealed up. And when we come back, we'll meet you back in the dyno. You got four over there now, don't you? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm not a sir yet, dude. We're back and the LS7 is docked and ready for its bolt-ons. Now we'll start with a set of Henman Hustler muscle rod mid-length headers. These are for a first-gen Camaro with an LS swap, which is where this engine is headed. They have a 3 8 inch flange to avoid warping and a 1 and 3 quarter inch set of primaries dump into a 3 inch collector. To hold them in place, a set of stage 8 lock and header bolts. With them tight, install the locking retainer and finally the clip into the groove of the bolt head. Now there's no chance of one coming out. To keep it cool, a Mazir electric water pump. Now, factory harnesses can be pretty bulky and actually clutter up an engine bay. And aftermarket harnesses, well, they can be kind of expensive. So the best solution we've found to this is by an ex-GM engineer that has one of the nicest harnesses we've ever used. His company is called Speartech, and this is the LS7 manual wiring harness with electronic throttle control kit. It's custom built to fit the engine like a glove and uses a high temp, high abrasion resistance covering. To protect the engine circuits, it has its own fuse block and came with an E38 pre-programmed ECM. And there's only three connections for power. Now we can attach the rubber inlet elbow to the throttle body, followed by the mass airflow sensor and tube, and to cap it all off, a conical filter from AirAid. This aeromotive fitting connects the factory fuel rail to a Dash 8 hose. John, you ready and clear? Yes, sir. Here we go. Now, so far, we swapped the dread oiling system for a wet sump to make this LS7 a more swap-friendly engine. With good oil pressure and the engine to temp, the thing loads up so nice. We're making a few baseline runs before the next phase of this build. Here we go. 493, 491. All right. That's well, pretty poor for a brand new set of rings on the first pool. Sounded good. Pulled good. I saw a good number on there. Yes, sir. 542 horsepower, 510 pound feet. That's our baseline. All righty. Why all the teardown? To get ready for the next phase of this project, which is a new camshaft and intake manifold. By now, we all know how well LS engines respond to aftermarket camshafts. So we ordered this comp one with this in mind, a broad top end power range. Now it requires a spring upgrade, which we got covered. It has an RPM range from 2400 to 7200 RPM, and it's in Comp's all-out power family. Duration at 50 for the intake is 239, exhaust is 255. Valve lift is 624 on the intake and the exhaust. The intake center line is 110 degrees. The heads have to come off so we can replace the valve springs due to our higher lift camshaft. Now, even though the old spring looks like the new spring, they're completely different. Now the factory spring is only good to 600 inch of lift before we run into coal bind. You can see right here we have no more room on our camshaft lift. Now with our new spring set up at the exact same height at 600, you can see how much extra room we have for more lift. They also have a higher spring rate, which can handle more RPM. With all the original components bolted on, here comes the fast 102 millimeter intake manifold that will complement the additional camshaft lift. It's constructed of polymer and accepts all the factory hardware. Now we installed fast rails and new 39 pound injectors. With a new tune in the ECM, good oil pressure and the engine warmed up, we're ready to go. Oh, 612, 541 foot pounds of torque. It's a good start, it's still climbing though. With a few runs to 6,500 RPM, this LS7 is making awesome power. 615 on power, 548 at torque, picked up seven Man. foot pounds. That's good power. That's a clean graph, too. Man, that thing looks beautiful. It's better all the way around. All right, Johnny, I'm gonna take an extra 300 to 68 and see if it's still making power from there. Okay. Nice, smooth pull. 
622 horsepower, 548 foot-pounds. Nice. Nice level flat curve too. It's maintaining that power, but it's not climbing. Yeah. Man, it's still gonna be pulling that car down the road. <laughs> this is gonna be a fast 67. We converted the oil system from the factory dret system to a true wet sump. That made this LS7 more compact for swaps. After the performance parts, we made a gain of 80 horsepower from our baseline. That is the perfect example of why LS power plants are so popular. We'll be right back. LS engines are taking over the streets and the racetrack, mostly because they're affordable and respond well to aftermarket parts. Here's a little trick that'll lead to more accurate ignition timing and give you more tuning capabilities. By using this Goodson Reluctor Wheel Jig, I'm gonna be able to show you guys how to change an LS crankshaft over from a 24 tooth Reluctor to a 58 tooth. The reason is I wanna run a late model computer on this thing later on down the road, like an E38 or something. But the problem is this cranks from an older style engine and has a 24 tooth Reluctor. So the first thing we need to do is get it off. We'll use our Matco air chisel to remove the ring. Now don't try this with a hammer, cause you could miss damage the crank. A slight chamfer needs to be put in the new Reluctor's ring seat and the leading edge. Now the ring must be clocked correctly to the crankshaft or a faulty signal will be read from the crank sensor. The Goodson jig will precisely align it and keep it square for the next step. Some slow and steady pressure to the top of the jig. With the ring seated, yes, sir. we can remove the jig and the crank's ready for its next venture. A stock clutch won't last behind an LS7 making the kind of power we did back on the dyno today. But this Quartermaster Optimum SR will. It's a 10.4 inch single disc clutch made for late model Corvettes, Camaros and Pontiac G8s. Now it'll handle 500 foot pounds of torque and 700 horsepower. Now it's completely rebuildable and 50% lighter than a stock piece. Plus, it'll give you that factory pedal feel. Now, it comes with the flywheel attached, and it's all billet construction is held together with aircraft grade fasteners. You can get one in your ride for just over 2100 bucks. Do you have an Optima battery that you need to get secured into your hot rod? Well, good, because I've got something I want to show you. It's the Fessler built battery mount for the most popular Optima series, the 34 and the 3478. Now it's 100% CNC machined out of a billet chunk of aluminum, and this one's actually polished to a jewelry finish. It's an absolute great way to clean up the engine bay or the trunk if that's where you've got it. Now if the polish doesn't suit your fancy, they're also offered in a natural finish, or you can get them anodized. Now you can check out the ones you want at summitracing.com, with prices starting at 129 bucks. How would you like better fuel efficiency, throttle response, and more lower end torque out of your Chevy or GMC truck or SUV? Well, for 50 bucks, you can add one of Volant's Vortis's throttle body spacers and gain up to 15 foot-pounds of torque. Now, this thing will work with your factory airbox or with one of Volant's cold air systems. It's made from a glass-filled nylon composite, so it won't corrode like aluminum, and you can pick yours up at summitracing.com. Well, that's it for this week's engine power. We'll see you next time.